Good afternoon, everyone. I'm going to call to order our meeting of the Housing Policy and Development Committee. I'm Cam Gordon, I chair the committee. I'm joined today with my vice chair, Councilmember Ellison, also Councilmembers Goodman, Bender, Schrader, and Wright. We're a quorum of the committee and we can conduct the business. Before us, we have on our agenda um, two public hearings, uh, one consent item and one discussion item. And before we take up the public hearings, I'd like to just move the consent item. And this is item three on the printed agenda. That's a lease renewal for city-owned properties at 913 and 919 Columbus Avenue South to Baraka Plaza. Anyone want to pull that off for discussion? Seeing none then, I will move that item for approval. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed, say no. Any abstentions? That motion carries. Then we'll move back up to item number one, uh, which is our first public hearing, and this is on the land sale of 822 Elwood Avenue. And uh, Mr. Ramadan will make a presentation. Welcome. Good afternoon, Mr. Chair, members of the committee. We have one land sale, uh, which is 822 Elwood Avenue North. Uh, the sale is through the Minneapolis Homes Program. The policies of the program were established by the City Council on December 11, 2015 and February 10, 2017. The staff recommends the sale of 822 Elwood Avenue North to Jaslyn Talley doing business as 822 Elwood Avenue North LLC for its appraised value of $65,000 subject to conditions. Staff has continuously marketed this property to an email listserv of well over 2,800 recipients. A total of nine applications were received for this property. Our recommendation is based upon the application that ranked highest by our staff review and it reflects the neighborhood's preference. The purchase of 822 Elwood Avenue North has secured sufficient bank financing to, re to rehab this fourplex and, and intends to be the owner occupant of one of the units. She will lease the other three units to low to moderate income households. CPET's construction management staff reviewed the scopes of work and estimates submitted by the applicant's builder and confirmed they are sufficient to meet the minimum construction standards of the program. Notification was provided to the Northside Residence Redevelopment Council on May 23, 2019. Uh, due to her work schedule, Jasmine Talley was unable to attend this meeting is not here today. Are there any questions for me? I don't see any questions. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. I will open the public hearing then. Uh, if any, in case anybody wants to come and speak to this issue, you can step forward now and introduce yourself. Seeing nobody step forward, then I'll close the public hearing. Uh, any council members want to make any comments or make the motion? I'm happy to make it. Um, council Member Elson. I'm happy to move approval. <laughs> all right. On that then, all those in favor say aye. Aye. Any opposed say no. That motion carries. Then we'll move on to item number two. This is approving the uh, project financing, um, at least the part that the city's involved with, for the Gateway Northeast uh, project at 2435 Marshall Street. Northeast and Ms. Carr will make a presentation. Good afternoon, Chair Gordon, members of the committee. I'm Emily Carr, a senior project coordinator with CPED. Before the committee today are several actions related to the financing of the Gateway Northeast project. The Gateway Northeast project, a uh, development by Common Bond Communities, is a 128 unit mixed income and mixed use project located at 2435 Marshall Street Northeast in the Botano neighborhood. The project is five stories above grade, includes 97 underground parking spaces and 8,500 square feet of commercial space. Of the 128 units, 77 units are affordable with a range of affordability from 30% area median income to 60% area median income. 10 three bedroom units um, will be at 30% area median income or AMI and will be reserved for families experiencing homelessness. 16 of the units will be at 50% AMI, 51 units at 60% AMI, and 51 of the units will be at market rate. The 26 units that will be at 30% AMI and 50% AMI will be assisted with project-based vouchers from the Minneapolis Public Housing Authority, and the households in those units will not pay more than 30% of their income towards rent. The total development cost of the project is $39 million, 129,000, and $978. Primary financing includes 4% low income housing tax credits, housing revenue bonds, and tax increment financing. The first staff recommendation before you is to establish a new housing TIF district for the Gateway Northeast project. 
The city would issue a TIF pay-as-you-go note not to exceed $2.5 million. Staff has reviewed the other financing sources included in this project and concluded that each source has been maximized to the extent possible and that the amount of TIF recommended is the lowest amount necessary for the project to proceed. It is currently projected that the note would be paid back in 26 years, the maximum allowed under state law. The second staff recommendation is to issue up to $23 million in bonds to fund the permanent financing of this project. The third staff recommendation is to approve up to $280,000 in a supplemental affordable housing trust fund award. This supplemental trust fund award re reflects two things. The first is changes in the 2019 trust fund program that increase the unit award amount from $25,000 to $30,000 per unit. And two, staff has worked with common bond communities and other funding partners to help identify additional service funding to help deepen the affordability of the project so that the number of three bedroom units at 30% AMI increase from three units to 10 units. And those seven additional three bedroom units at 30% AMI are eligible for additional funding from the city's large family housing initiative pool within the trust fund program. The approval of the TIF, bonds, and additional trust fund dollars are the last remaining funding pieces to this project. Approval of these sources will position the project to close in November and start construction this year. So with that, I'd be happy to answer any questions. And there's also representatives from Common Bond here as well. I don't see any questions, but I thank you for that excellent report and also for all the work that's gone into this rather large and complicated project. So appreciate that. Um, th this is an opportunity for a public hearing, though, on this issue, so I will open the public hearing, and if somebody from Common Bond wants to come up, that would be fine. Um, it's not necessary, but appreciate it. Welcome. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Andy Hughes. I'm the Director of Acquisition and Development for Kanban Communities. I'm joined by Cecile Bador, Executive Vice President for Real Estate at Kanban. I'm pleased to be here today and ask for the committee's support for our TIF tax-exempt bond and affordable housing trust fund financing for our Gateway Northeast project. The project promises to become an important community resource upon its completion in early 2021. It'll include 120 units of housing in a neighborhood and neighborhood-oriented retail, as well as underground parking. The housing will be true mixed income with various affordability levels of 30, 50, and 60% AMI, as well as market rate units. Uh, the requested financing is critical to the project's feasibility, and we work strenuously to identify outside resources to minimize the city's participation to the greatest extent possible. This includes investing our own substantial resources in the project. Thank you for your support. Thank you very much. Is there anyone else here who would like to speak on this? Seeing no one, then I will close the public hearing and open it to committee members to uh, make comments if they'd like. Um, I, I know this is in the third ward. It's awfully close to the first ward, though, so Council Member Reich. Um, thank you, Mr. Chair. I'll move the item and note that not only is it across the street from the first ward, it's across the river from two other wards. And we all are trying to find the right kind of mix that grows the city but also stabilizes it. And I think the income mix that is proposed here um, truly represents that. And also I think there's a demonstrable um, area where this is a market failure site. There's two or three different attempts over the years to do a market rate project and they never could quite pull it together. And so here we're intervening and meeting our public goals around housing and stability in our community. So it, it strikes a lot of good points and happy to move it. Thank you very much. Then on uh, Council Member Wright's motion, all those in favor say aye. Aye. Any opposed? Any abstentions? That motion carries then, and the financing is approved. Now we'll move on to our discussion item. This is um, a report on the anti-displacement policy network, uh, something that the city participated in. And uh, Ms. Topinka will... Uh, lead off the presentation or make the presentation. Welcome. Right. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon, Chair Gordon and committee members. I'm Katie Topinka, Housing Policy Coordinator at CPED Housing. Um, and I'm here today to uh, present on the uh, work um, and, and bring forward a report on the work of the Anti-Displacement Policy Network. Uh, Minneapolis and St. Paul had a joint team that participated in this network uh, that was hosted by PolicyLink. Um, and I'm going to get into more details about the network itself, um, but first, um, 
um, just wanted to mention when the opportunity to apply to be part of this network came up, um, the city together with St. Paul jumped at the chance because it's really um, was um, in line with a lot of the work the city was doing um, that's really rooted in uh, racial equity. Um, so before we get into details about the network, um, Nick Campbell uh, from the uh, Office of Race and Equity is going to just give a brief update on the strategic and racial equity action plan uh, priority around housing. Thank you very much. Thank you, Katie. Um, Chair Gordon, committee members. Um, so yeah, before Katie gets or gets into the report on the anti-displacement um, policy network, the Division of Race and Equity would like to provide a, a very brief update on the Strategic and Racial Equity Action Plan. Um, specifically, uh, we wanted to uh, ensure we grounded the conversation uh, and the work happening through the anti-displacement network in the context of the housing priority of the plan um, that was adopted in July. Um, so uh, this is the strategic need that uh, City Council adopted at the end of July. As you recall, the, the need shifted from what Council, what you all drafted uh, back in February, which explicitly targeted reducing evictions um, to focus on reducing involuntary displacement in rental housing for black, indigenous, and people of color. Um, again, this was refined after two full days of work sessions where city staff, community partners, residents uh, use data to uh, both refine the strategic need uh, and develop the various components of the plan uh, for this priority area. One of the major drivers uh, of this shift away from focusing solely on formal evictions was the evidence that suggests BIPOC communities experiment, experience displacement outside of that formal eviction process. Um, so. This is, again, the content that was adopted back in uh, July. Um, we, our division will leave it to Regulatory Services and CPED, who are the process owners for this specific priority, uh, recognizing Regulatory Services. Um, Kim Keller wasn't able to make it today. She had a conflict. Um, but they can provide any more detailed updates on the work happening in this priority area. Um, and I do want to note that through the planning process, the focus of leveraging the city's relationship with property owners uh, is specifically cal called out in this priority of the plan, um, partly because for all the work happening throughout the region um, to reduce displacement in BIPOC communities, uh, including the work um, happening in the anti-displacement network, the city is, in a un in unique, is unique in that it has a very formal relationship with property owners uh, that other entities and jurisdictions do not have. Uh, that can be leveraged to reduce both formal evictions uh, and uh, involuntary displacement. And so I just want to note this is lifted up as a significant opportunity during the planning process. So could I just ask, and I know you, you referred us to um, reg services, but do we have a baseline numbers for these measures so far, the lagging indicators and the metrics of urgency? So not, not that we're, nothing has been changed yet as, as what was adopted that I'm aware of, but again, uh, regulatory services would have more info on that. Um, what's, we know that we as a city don't necessarily capture data on that right now, um, but I uh, just want to recognize Eric from Homeline is in uh, the room and we use some of that, their data that they capture with um, who calls their tenant hotline um, and what the breakdown of those calls are to help us understand how many people are um, experiencing those informal uh, uh, involuntary displacement um, th through notice to vacate and things like that. So I think part of that work that's happening is to figure out what, what, are we, what is going to be used to help measure, to establish a baseline and begin measuring those. Well, this is definitely something I think that the committee is going to want to um, stay on top of and track and, and assist with. So. Um, I look forward to hearing more and, and following that as it goes forward. And thanks for being here. Thank you. Oh, and uh, Council Member uh, Bender, sorry. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I didn't mean to be a starter, but um, I wondered if you could highlight for us, that, and if not, it's okay. We can follow up too. Sure. What? What? Because this this issue of adding um, non eviction displacement came from the community process. Mm -hmm. Um, we had started out with something we were pretty sure we could measure and that was very narrowly focused on evictions. Mm -hmm. And because members from the community process came and said, we want to really focus on both, that's included here. And mm -hmm. I, I think it's great. I mm -hmm. think you should welcome that. Was there, um, were folks able to voice what are some of the underlying reasons that folks are facing 
non-eviction displacement. I mean, rising rent seems to come to mind. Were there other, have we gotten that far in the process so that we know what measures people, mm -hmm. what, what phenomenon are happening so that we figure out how we may measure it or do we still need to do some groundwork to understand um, the first part of that question. Sure. Um, again, I don't want to speak too much into it. Um, I'll let those who are kind of the experts on that do it, but I think there definitely is some additional data even provided by Homeline that digs into some of those other reasons that are not just related to, okay, not related to eviction. Um, and also, again, recognizing, I think, thinking about the unique role the city has through our relationship with property owners, that can both impact evictions, but there's also a significant opportunity to have an impact, not just the formal evictions that are happening. And so it can be leveraged both ways. I think it was important not to leave out um, one. Yeah. Well, yeah, kind of thanks. Think. Um, thanks, Mr. Chair, Council okay. President Bender. Um, so CPAD and Reg Services are sort of co-process owners on, on this action item. and. Um, so the, in the community discussion that we had around this, um, there was a, a lot of discussion about the need to work upstream from the eviction, the formal eviction process. So um, there's a lot of recognition that a lot of displacement occurs outside of the formal eviction process, first of all. And second of all, to the extent that ultimately displacement does come from the eviction process, the, the best solutions are upstream from the actual act of filing that. And so um, there's a whole host of um, specific um, reasons or issues or concerns that were raised as part of this. Um, uh, you know, it, and part of it is, um, you know, there's definitely discussion about rising rents, but, but um, also a discussion about how rents, um, just the, the, the mismatch between the incomes of, of um, low-income households and low-income families and, and where rents currently are today. And um, so just the, you know, the, the, the rates of cost burden and the inability to, um, you know, continue to make make the rent um, when you're paying 40, 50, or more percent of your income for rent. Um, there's also a lot of discussion around habitability issues, um, and uh, as well as discussion around sort of the, just the different um, sort of points of influence that you know renters and, and landlords have. I guess I'm just curious the timeline for taking those kind of elements and, and back to the chair's underlying question. Um, what's our process to, for taking those things that we've heard through the community process or that any of us could list off that we hear from our constituents and turning them into measurable indicators? Sure, uh, Mr. Chair, Council President Bender. We um, we had intended on, on coming back to this committee either later this year or possibly in early 2020 to just report um, as a sort of you know discussion or, or receive and file or presentation on just the the like collective work that's happening around um, eviction prevention. So um, you know there's there's eviction prevention work that's happening at the county and reforming the emergency assistance um, process, which we think is really critical to this. Um, there's the the work um, that the city is funding around legal representation. Um, uh, in evictions and habitability cases. So looking at that as well as um, the, the metrics of urgency and the specific actions identified through the ESRI process, we wanted to come back and give um, a, a little bit more detailed kind of overview of all of that at a later date. I, I think that would, that'll be helpful and I'll look forward to that. I just some of the measures look like they're easier to have a number on. Um, one of them mentions a frequency, so how are we going to measure that frequency? Mm -hmm. um, and it's a frequency <laughs> of move and relocation. Um, so how do we measure that? And then how are we going to, even if we are able to find out every time somebody moves? So just from my position up here, that's pretty tricky. People do that on their own. There's nobody registering. I'm moving now. Um, and then whether it's voluntary or involuntary. So. Mm -hmm. That, I guess, my question about do we have the baseline information yet, I think that's going to be important that we try mm -hmm. to figure out how do we get that, who are our partners who are going to help us, what are we working with, um, just so we can think we're making a difference later when we get back and try to measure it later. So I just want to hold that up now and also acknowledge, I guess, that some of that could be pretty challenging. We've identified some interesting things and approved these as kind of our metrics, but um, we'll, I look forward to digging into it more. Okay. 
All right, uh, thank you. So um, just wanted to get into a little bit more detail then about um, the anti-displacement policy network uh, work, what the network was, what our uh, team focused on, and, and next steps. And um, one of our team members, Owen Duckworth, uh, who's the director of policy and in organizing with the Alliance, is going to come up in a few moments to help with the presentation as well. Um, so um, and, and what we're bringing forward today, um, in addition to the presentation, is a written report um, that that is uh, really a, a, a report that comes from both the uh, City of Minneapolis, City of St. Paul, and all of the community advocates who are part of our team. So the report, the written report you have is really a joint effort. Um, so uh, Minneapolis and St. Paul applied together to be part of the Anti-Displacement Policy Network. As I mentioned before, um, this network is, was hosted by PolicyLink, uh, which is a national research and advocacy organization that works to advance racial and economic equity. Um, um, and the Anti-Displacement Policy Network is part of its larger All-In Cities initiative, um, and they launched that initiative in 2015, and it's really aimed at equipping city officials, community advocates, and civic leaders with policy ideas, data, and strategy support to build equitable, thriving cities. Um, and so uh, the network goal, which is up on the slide here, is was for low-income people, indigenous people, marginalized LGBTQ people, and people of color to experience increased housing security and less housing, business, and cultural displacement in their communities. Um, and so that was the overarching goal of the network. Um, our team, so there were 10 cities that participated in this network, and I'll show you who those cities were on the next slide. Um, our team was unique because we were made up of two cities, um, Minneapolis and St. Paul. Every team that was in the network had a mix of elected officials, city staff, and community advocates um, that made up the team. So our Minneapolis team was Council Vice President uh, Jenkins, uh, Council Member Ellison, um, our Housing Director Andrea Brennan, uh, Owen, Dr. Worth, who you'll hear from a moment, um, and then Shannon Jones, who's the ex executive director of Hope Community. Um, she couldn't be here today, but Will Delaney from Hope is here. Um, and then I participated on the team as well. And then we had lots of support from others as well, including uh, Council Member Ellison and Council Vice President Jenkins policy aides, who did a lot of work um, in the network. And then the St. Paul team had a similar makeup of, uh, of Council Member staff and community advocates. Um, and there were 10 cities, and here's the list of cities um, that participated in the network. Um, all of these cities are experiencing challenges similar to those we are feeling here, um, where there's um, uh, economic growth, but then communities who are at risk of displacement because of, of some of that growth. Um, and uh, the network met monthly in uh, what PolicyLink called learning labs, but webinars where one city presented to the other cities on strategies they were pursuing to try to prevent displacement in their communities. Our team was actually one of the first to present. Um, we talked about using um, data to reframe narratives around neighborhoods and communities, and Owen's going to talk a little bit more about that um, and about the idea of reframing the narrative around communities, but it was really trying to use more asset-based language to describe uh, communities um, rather than sort of deficit-based language like areas of concentrated poverty. Um, and so our team shared how we were able to um, uh, reframe the narrative and, and make changes to um, the analysis of impediments to fair housing, which really um, governs the way federal th housing funding is awarded in the region. Um, we learned uh, interesting strategies from other cities. There were a lot of common themes, um, which were around tenant protections, uh, community ownership, and community engagement. Um, so a couple examples, Portland shared um, about a large community engagement um, strategy and, and um, campaign that was undertaken to get anti-displacement strategies um, in their comprehensive plan. Uh, Santa Fe shared uh, work they are doing to explore creating an anti-displacement zoning overlay district. And really the idea is that there'd be a zoning district where certain uh, infrastructure and housing investments would be um, prioritized if there's risk of displacement. Um, several cities talked about uh, different land trust models they're exploring, like Buffalo and Denver. Um, and then Nashville uh, shared that they had a huge um, campaign to create a community benefits agreement around a new professional soccer stadium, so really focused on one specific large infrastructure development and how to prevent displacement around that. 
Uh, our team uh, uh, got the opportunity to travel to Austin together last fall, which is one of the network cities. Um, and this, uh, what the, on the slide here, is a poster we brought to help facilitate discussion there. Um, and so we created this poster to talk about some of the goals that our team had. And you'll see the goal listed here. Um, all people in marginalized communities will be able to remain in place with access to stable housing, opportunities to build wealth, and a sense of belonging while maintaining cultural assets and identity. Um, and we identified a number of strategies that we discussed throughout the year to help achieve this goal. Um, and, and Owen's going to talk a little bit more about the themes around those strategies in a moment. Um, at the convening, we learned about efforts Austin is undertaking uh, to create long-term affordability. Um, they had a ballot initiative to, to uh, bond, to fund affordable housing just before we got out there. Um, we also got to do a bus tour around the city, and we saw a community land trust um, in a neighborhood where there are a lot of residents at risk of uh, displacement. Um, and that land trust actually created a uh, preference policy so that residents who were at risk of displacement had preference to own a home in that land trust. And so that was something that um, piqued the interest of our team and we talked, uh, talked a lot about both in Austin and afterward. Um, and it's something we're continuing to explore and I'll talk a bit more about that. Um, and then uh, our team this past spring held a couple of community forums to share out what we had learned from being in the network and then also to get input from members of our community to see if the strategies we had learned about and talked about resonated or if there were other things we should be thinking about um, that we maybe didn't learn about by participating in the network. Um, and so we had one in St. Paul, one in Minneapolis, um, and the um, discussions at the forums are also reflected in the, the written report and helped inform that report. Some of the themes uh, we heard about there, again, really um, an emphasis on um, a need for strong tenant protections and um, an emphasis on community ownership. Um, and that it should really focus both on home ownership and business ownership. Um, and then there's just a lot of discussion about uh, community engagement and how to do development with engaging uh, community early in the process. Um, and so I'm gonna turn it over to Owen to talk about our, uh, some of the themes our team discussed a lot throughout the year and some of the benefits um, and challenges of participating in this network. Hi, um, welcome. Thank you. Um, uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Chair and members of the committee. I'm moving this a little bit. Um, my name is Owen Duckworth. I'm the Director of Organizing and Policy at the Alliance for Metropolitan Stability. Um, again, I think as um, Katie referenced, we sort of got invited to be part of um, the Anti-Displacement Policy Network through some um, past work that we had done as part of our Equity in Place Coalition in sort of working with the Fair Housing Implementation Council on redoing the regional analysis of impediments to fair housing. Um, and we're appreciative of being asked to be part of this process. Um, I'll run through themes really quickly here um, and then talk a little about some of the challenges and benefits um, that we saw as part of the process. So one of the things we, we started with, um, right, this is uh, an opportunity we felt to talk about narrative, talk about the ways in which uh, cities, the ways in which decision-making bodies approach talking about, thinking about um, problems as it pertains to, um, to housing issues and specifically in this case displacement issues. Um, a lot of our work has been um, with the Alliance with Equity in Place to sort of push for reframing narratives. Uh, frequently we've encountered even folks doing affordable housing advocacy, repeating narratives that sort of subtly or not so subtly reinforce negative stereotypes about people of color, about tenants, um, about communities of color that either forward um, the logic of, of displacement or disinvestment. Um, so we really wanted to center sort of an approach that uh, shifted language in the context of these conversations and also understanding the arc of history, right? Our understanding the arc of, of segregation, redlining, disinvestment, racial covenants, all these things that are still very present, even if some of them exist in the past, they're still very present in terms of the landscape of housing opportunities in our, um, in our region. So, um, so that was one of, one of the major themes. Community ownership, um, again, as mentioned, uh, land trust models, cooperative models, um, ways to allow, especially for communities who traditionally haven't been given access to uh, quality banking and credit, opportunities to potentially own homes, own stake in, in, um, in their buildings. Um, equitable development, so again, thinking about how have, especially communities have experienced decades of disinvestment, um, 
how how a new development is happening, are there ways for community to actually help drive or name what community needs are and, and influence processes? Um, so a lot of conversation around that, um, in particular uh, some piece about the equitable development scorecard, which is a tool that a number of communities are using in our region to um, uh, assess what are principles of equitable development and then how do, when they interact with, with planners, with developers, with the city, um, have those be uh, sort of manifested in, in the creation of, of new development. Um, tenant protections and preservation of affordable housing. So a lot of conversation, of course, on uh, NOAA preservation, naturally occurring affordable housing. Um, and with that, of course, a set of, um, of other policies around tenant protections. Of course, the city's moving on a number of these. So that's much appreciated to see that that's becoming, some of those are becoming um, real and tangible uh, in meaningful ways. Community engagement, as mentioned as well, how, do, how does community participate in in processes around decision making, um, and especially as pertains to potential displacement risk. So there's a lot there, I won't get into that, but uh, an important uh, piece as well. And then a regional approach, right? The, obviously this was a, um, a, a um, cohort locally that included Minneapolis and St. Paul, both the cities. Obviously these issues are, are regional in scale as well. People get displaced either from the cities to other parts of the region or move to the cities after being displaced, right? So. Um, the infrastructure that exists throughout the region and opportunities that exist for people to have housing, stay in housing, access affordable housing, um, and, and community are at a regional level as well. So, um, and then in terms of, so hit enter. Um, benefits and challenges, um, certainly for, um, there's a lot of um, confirmation of some of the existing strategies, both the city was taking that community uh, organizations at the table as well, we're really pushing for uh, a number of new policy ideas generated, um, including the preference policy was one piece that came up. Um, so both stuff from just the interactions between the sort of non-traditional partners at that table, as well as hearing from other parts of the, of the country. Um, and then uh, benefits again, being able to have some sort of very real, very open conversations about kind of worldview, how people approach the issues, um, people's inherent assumptions, I think was really beneficial. And that leads into building stronger relationships and uh, potential working partnerships. Uh, challenges, um, again, this is cross -jur jurisdictional work. So figuring out how do Minneapolis and St. Paul interact with each other, the speed at which each city does things, the politics of each city, uh, politics of community relative to city, we're all different um, on different sides of the river, as you might imagine. Um, deciding how to prioritize, right? You can come up with a laundry list of, of things to do and figuring out what is most impactful, what is feasible, what is um, most relevant to uh, community voices, um, all were part of that. And then again, working through different viewpoints and positions, and that's both sort of thinking of the world, thinking of the issues, people's politics, but then also um, kind of positionally, right? This is a unique situation where you have community organizations, you have city staff, you have elected officials. They have vastly different um, roles in the context and, and sort of power in terms of moving and, and working on these issues. So a lot of conversation as well around um, who does what in that context. So I think that's it from, from me. I'm happy to, I guess, I don't know if I'm supposed to take questions or Happy to sit down too. So, thank you. <laughs> thank you. Uh, thank you, Owen. And um, I really, um, Owen touched on sort of the relationships and how that was a huge benefit of being part of this. And it was really, I think, valuable for from a city staff standpoint. I think the council members uh, found it valuable to have just that that team of um, both community advocates and city staff and council members all at the table talking through these issues together. So thank you for being part of it and for being willing to speak today. Um, and I just wanted to emphasize uh, to, um, so that that relationship, the relationship working across cities has been really helpful um, because as Owen mentioned, our cities are working on some similar policies, some different policies, but we really were able to learn a lot from each other um, and, and plan to continue to do so um, as part of this network. Um, and then um, one other thing I just wanted to mention is um, the the relationships we made with other cities in the network has been incredibly valuable as we're working on policy development here in the city. Um, we've been able to reach out to other cities that are considering similar policies or have in, in many cases already passed similar policies and get, um, get just feedback from them or um, research or things they looked at to, to develop their policies and that's been really beneficial. And we've also had cities reach out to us quite a bit to ask similar questions. So that's been, that's been great. 
I think Council Member Ellison has a question or comment right now. I just wanted to make a comment just for my colleagues to who've all been in spaces where we're collaborating with folks who are not who are who, who are in the community, but I just wanted to sort of emphasize how um, how unique the experience felt collaborating with community with community members and city staff. I feel like often you know, where um, where decisions happen and how decisions get made uh, can be pretty opaque. Uh, and I think it was particular, you know, and often you'll have elected officials maybe um, uh, uh, sharing time with, with community members, but for, for our staff to be able to also be interfacing with, um, uh, 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 with community members as well uh, in in a kind of an intimate space, I would I would use that word um, over the course of a year, uh, and it almost feels inappropriate to have uh, 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 Owen presenting to us. I feel like we should be presenting to uh, you know Hope and the Alliance, like you know uh, that we're really committed to to the work because uh, because because community did did take a, a year out of their uh, out of their uh, out of their time to to spend. Uh, to spend this time with us and to spend time with staff giving us their, their thoughts and ideas. So just wanted to, uh, you know, give you that thanks, even though, you know, in a public forum, so. Thank you. Um, so I'm um, going to wrap up here, but um, before we close, just wanted to talk a little bit about a number of the strategies um, that we are working on related to this displacement work and then just where, uh, where we're going, what our next steps are from here. Um, so throughout the course of, of participating in the network, we, um, along the way, evaluated city policies, programs, and strategies to try to reflect what we were learning um, in the network and through our team discussions. Um, so um, Minneapolis 2040, um, uh, that was wrapping up as we were in the early stages of the network, but we did, there is a policy um, that was influenced by what we were learning around um, involuntary displacement um, that's in, in Minneapolis 2040, and it's that we will minimize the involuntary displacement of people of color, indigenous people, and vulnerable populations, such as low-income households, the elderly, and people with disabilities from their communities as the city grows and changes. So um, that's in 2040. There's a similar statement that was adopted as part of the um, um, unified housing policy when that was updated late last year um, and um, some of the, that language is also reflected in the renters first policy that the council adopted earlier this year um, and and really we're looking at that type of language or um, uh, in in a number of the programs that we're operating um, the network, as, as Owen commented, also helped confirm for us that a number of the strategies we were considering or had already undertaken um, were in line with other anti-displacement strategies um, in cities around the country. Um, so one of those is uh, inclusionary zoning policy, um, the uh, renter protections and, and the fair access to housing ordinance that was recently adopted, um, NOAA preservation policies such as advance notice of sale, and also the investments we're making in um, for both acquisition um, and um, incentives to maintain NOAA housing through the 4D program. Um, and other, and, uh, a number of the other cities talked about trying to make new investment in affordable housing as a strategy um, as well. And so obviously the large investment that uh, the city has made in the Affordable Housing Trust Fund um, fits in here as well. And the investments in um, eviction and habitability legal representation. So kind of having a range of strategies um, available to people to help them remain um, in their housing or of access to affordable housing opportunities. Um, and then I just also wanted to touch on um, our Minneapolis Homes programs, um, which really are anti-displacement strategies as well, particularly um, owner-occupied rehabilitation uh, programs, which are aimed at keeping people in homes that are affordable and safe. Um, um, and as part of uh, work in Minneapolis homes, we're looking at new long-term affordability models. Um, currently, 20% of Minneapolis homes financed projects are long-term affordable, which we define as being affordable at 80% of area median income for 30 years or more. Um, and so the number of long-term affordable homes we're producing is limited by uh, capacity um, of our uh, providers um, and um, and city itself, and so we're, there's a study underway to try to expand long-term affordable options in the Minneapolis Homes programs, and we expect recommendations for that um, next spring. Um, so that's another strategy um, that's sort of ongoing um, in this in this vein. So those are just some of the strategies that we have been working on and continue to work on around um, anti-displacement in the city. 
Um, so then next steps, where is our team going from here? Um, we have identified a number of ways we want to continue working together as a team. Um, uh, the council had a staff direction for us to pilot anti-displacement strategies around specific development sites, um, and specifically Upper Harbor and the North and South Green Zones. So staff is working on some recommendations to bring through the collaborative planning committee that's working on Upper Harbor project and then bring those forward. Um, I mentioned earlier the idea of a community preference policy, and that's really um, uh, the idea behind that is that there would be some sort of defined area where, um, or excuse me, some people, it's a defined area where people may be at risk of displacement, um, and different communities have done something like this and defined these areas in different ways, um, and that people living, people at risk of displacement in certain geographies would potentially have preference for certain housing programs. Um, and that, there, this is a really complex policy. <laughs> there are a lot of legal questions around it. There's administrative questions, and it would really need to be based on, on sound data. So there's a lot of data analysis that need to be done. But it's something that our team was interested in exploring further, and we've, we're in the early stages of exploring a lot of those questions with our city attorney's office, with program staff, and with outside experts who may be able to help with some of the data analysis. Um, Council Member Ellison may want to add something to that. Oh, I just wanted to, I heard one of my colleagues sort of ask, like, what, you know, the, the ask the question that you're answering now, which is like, what, what does this mean? And I just wanted to add that I think in, in Austin, I also heard it referred to as a right to return policy, if that language is helpful, right? So in some areas where displacement had, had, sort of had, had drastically occurred, right, not of everyone, right, but, but of many residents, um, you know, they're creating that preference for people to be able to come back to the neighborhood that they had grown up in or, or, or whatever. So just wanted to add that to, to the answer that Kitty was giving, um, that I remember hearing it referred to, the, uh, to uh, as that in Austin. So thank you. That's helpful. And, and Councilmember Jenkins, welcome. And you wanted to add some more to this. Oh, thank you, um, Chair. And, you know, I just wanted to take a moment to to publicly thank staff and, and echo uh, Council Member Ellison's comments about community members being at the table. It was a, a really um, awesome opportunity, I think, to sit with groups like Hope Communities and um, the Alliance and, and the team from St. Paul and really think about these issues, talking to other cities, um, and seeing some of the policies and initiatives that they are putting forward, it really struck me that um, many of the policies that are really considered innovative in, in other cities we had already been doing and, and thinking about doing. And so it just speaks to the perniciousness of this affordable housing um, issue. And I think we have to really continue to think of um, creative and, and innovative um, strategies to, to help um, resolve some of these issues. And um, I'm really glad that CPAT staff is really focused on this issue and really working to keep people in place in communities as opposed to uh, being displaced by development. So um, I'm proud to, to have been a part of this work and, and to continue to be a part of this work. I think it really dovetail really great with our 2040 vision and uh, the strategic race equity work that we're doing and um, it's a big part of it. So thanks to um, Andrea, Brennan and um, Katie Tabinka and, and all the rest of the CPS staff that, that helped to bring this together. Well, and also thank you and Councilmember Ellison for being part of this team for, for the duration of it. And I, I might say, I know our staff really worked really hard on this too. So so Danny and, and Diva Sadar were really um, a part. Um, Diva went to Austin with the group and, and really contributed mightily to the whole process. So. Thanks to everybody. And I know we have a few more next steps, but Council Member Goodman, did you want to add something? Yeah, no, I just, I, I, I've read the next steps, sorry, I didn't, didn't mean to cut off Katie. A couple of things. Um, I agree with Council Member um, Jenkins that this is just an ongoing, persistent problem. And to me, it often feels like 
the collective we, the policymakers, the staff that do all the work on a daily basis, and the advocates take two steps forward, but then we have to consistently take one step back um, due to things that often have something to do with us and often don't have something to do with us. Um, I'll note that right now we're killing ourselves to do projects in the Harrison Bryn Mawr neighborhood area, the Bassett Creek Valley, and we finally have our first market rate project that is coming forward, yet it's going to displace five duplexes. Uh, so five houses are going to be torn down to build market rate housing in Harrison, and that might be a place where we can look at this exploring the preference policy. We certainly could see if that is something that we could voluntarily do because there's a lot of excitement surrounding uh, the first market rate housing project happening after LEAF and Wellington and Artspace have done such amazing work. And yet then the neighborhood is embracing a market rate project in that area, but we should note that that means five structures will be landfilled and 20 plus people will be displaced and would the developer be interested or willing or able under the law to incorporate those tenants into that space. And so as I see this next steps thing, I guess I don't see where this rent control motion falls into that because it's not on this list. I mean, so we have this whole process that we've gone through and all of these partners have been involved and everyone is thanking everybody for all the work they're doing and yet in two minutes we're gonna have you say, and we should do rent control, which isn't even part of this presentation. So how does that all fit together? Because given the state prohibition on rent control, studying it doesn't seem like a good use of resources. I don't understand where the resources are coming from and I don't see that action coming out of this report. So that's foreshadowing, I think, a motion that somebody's gonna make at the committee. Um, and so let's keep that in mind as we move forward and let's make sure that um, staff has a chance to go through the next steps if you wanna complete. I think you got to community ownership strategies. Do you wanna just finish your- Mr. Mr. Chair, oh, oh, my, I, I would just say that, um, um, I guess, rent control as it has been named or um, um, other other means of really trying to regulate um, how the increases in, in rent was a very big part of the discussion and um, and community members and I think um, and policymakers alike were really um, seriously you know discussing you know how how are we going to really make a dent in this problem and um you know i guess i was trying to allude to the fact that we're going to have to continue to think about creative and innovative and and potentially old ideas that um um we sort of abandon and and how we can address this issue because it seemingly is not going away and either we are going to think about how do we subsidize or try to maintain rents as they are Okay, so maybe we can finish the staff report and then we'll consider any motions that anybody might have on the committee. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. So um, uh, another uh, strategy we're digging into a little bit more, our community ownership strategies. I already touched on the long-term affordability report that will be coming forward next spring. Um, and I know there's already been uh, discussion uh, in some of the budget discussions about cultural corridors, um, but that's um, more on the business uh, ownership side. Um, and then our team has committed to continuing to meet, um, although the, the formal year with Policy Link um, hosting the network has ended. Our team, the Minneapolis St. Paul team, is going to continue meeting quarterly um, to continue sharing ideas and uh, working on strategies together. And um, we're still kind of working out what exactly um, uh, the meetings themselves will look like, but I think everybody is committed to working on a number of the strategies identified uh, in the report and also thinking about how to uh, work together um, on a more regional basis or to uh, tackle things that might be state um, or federal issues um, and how to use the team to, to do some of those things. Um, and then lastly, um, as I mentioned, one of the benefits of this was um, being able to exchange information with uh, the other network cities um, and, and 
planning to continue to do that. Um, one of the other cities already hosted a conference call with a number of us to, to continue talking about some of the strategies we've been working on here and how they might be able to uh, uh, consider similar things in their city. Um, so uh, that concludes my report and um, happy to take other questions if there are any. I, I'm just curious if, um, I mean, this is such a great report and this is good information and I'd love it if we could push it out and more people could hear about this. And it did occur to me that the Housing Advisory Committee, this is probably some these topics they've already discussed and they've looked at and so I want to make sure that at least the members, are, we push this out to them a little bit and they get to set their own agenda and all that and I'm not trying to do request that they take it up as the council but I just want to put that out there and maybe they've already discussed it and followed along just because of your association with them. Mm. Um, and that, you don't have to respond to that but that's a suggestion. Um, I don't see any other questions. Um, so uh, thank you very much. I do know that um, Council Member Ellison has something. Uh, yeah, so a uh, couple of things. One is I do want to really thank staff for uh, your time uh, spending on uh, the Anti-Displacement Network. I know that it was uh, quite the time commitment, even though we were only talking about maybe a few hours a month, it's still every month for a year, and that's a huge dedication uh, uh, for you all to put towards this. And so I want to thank you for, for the time you've spent um, uh, uh, putting this report together and being in those conversations, most importantly, uh, and prepping a lot, of, a lot of the meetings and doing a lot of research uh, and continuing to pursue, pursue policies like this right to return policy and other policies that, um, that came out of this. Um, I do have a staff direction uh, that is related to the, to the study of rent control. I do, uh, and I would echo what the council vice president said, which is that this was a topic that came up a lot uh, during our year in office, not just from community members from Minneapolis and St. Paul, but it came up a, a lot of other cities, um, even cities that were uh, that are also uh, state preempted from pursuing this kind of policy are still really interested in figuring out how do we pursue a policy like this. Um, and I think that uh, while there are two questions on the, the table, one is the can we, can't we question uh, that, uh, that uh, Councilmember Goodman um, uh, pointed out, uh, which I think is a good question. It's, a, it's, a, it's, it's, uh, it's something that we uh, that's not irrelevant in this discussion. Uh, I also think that there's uh, there's the should we, shouldn't we question. There's the question of what if we, uh, in, under ideal conditions, what would a policy like this look like? And I do think that we owe it to our constituents to explore that question and to uh, 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 sort of let them know what the roadblocks are and not just say, not just shrug our shoulders and say, hey, sorry, this would be a really great policy. This would help a lot of, a lot of constituents, but we're just not gonna pursue this because we, we're, we're just not sure if we can or can't. Uh, and so I'm happy to pass out this, uh, the, the motion. Uh, he, uh, to my colleagues, and I think I have enough copies that I'll put a few to the public as well. Oh, I guess I could just take one and okay. um, and then I'm <laughs> uh, and then I'm happy to read uh, read the staff direction. Um, yes, why don't you go ahead and do that so everybody can hear what it is? I mean, awesome. Um, so. Um, so we are directing staff, uh, we are directing the city coordinator's office with assistance from the community planning and economic development and regulatory services to contract with one or more consultants to undertake an economic impact analysis in order to evaluate, evaluate rent stabilization as a component of housing policy in Minneapolis. The consultant uh, the consulting contract should be in place no later than March 15, 2020. Staff should bring an update on progress to the Housing Policy and Development Committee by November 13, 2019. The contract de deliverables generally should include the following. One, establish a baseline and identify key factors for assessing annual rent increase caps as a rent stabilization policy in Minneapolis, which may include uh, distribution of rent burden, rent cost trends, rent vacancy and turnover, composition of housing stock, including age, ownership, and geographic dis uh, distribution of rental property. Two, analyze these, fact these key factors within the Minneapolis context to understand potential impacts on renters and building owners. Uh, key factors could include financial analysis of return on investment for rental property owners, economic impacts to overall local economy and housing supply in the short and long term, 
uh, associated with capping annual rent increases, housing stabilization outcomes for tenants, and three, provide potential models for consideration of rent stabilization policies that include rent in increase caps and the economic impiece, impact of those models. Thank you very much. Uh, we have a motion before us. Council Member Bender. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I just wanted to speak to the motion and um, was happy to bring this forward together with Council Member Ellison. And thank you, Mr. Chair, for your support as we um, contemplated how to start this discussion in our city. Uh, we, we did consider several options, one of which was to simply bring this idea forward as part of our budget process but wanted to give the chance to ground ourselves in the policy discussion and the kind of why of why we would take on um, this kind of analysis to understand how rent increase caps could benefit our community as an anti-displacement strategy. Um, so this was designed to introduce the idea in as transparent a way as possible, give ourselves time to create a scope of work, give staff time to create a scope of work, for us to understand if there is a budget need that we could then bring forward through the budget process as we do at the end of the year and then undertake the study from there. So maybe a multi-step process, um, depending on if there is funding and budget available for this within the department's uh, existing budget, which happens all the time, of course. Um, staff are contracting with consultants all the time without getting council approval. Uh, you know, under our rules, um, but if needed, we can, we, you know, there will be time to do the more formal process depending on the scale and scope of the amount. Uh, so I want to kind of describe some of those procedural things. I do want to say as a council member from Ward 10, my 80% of my ward uh, are renters, many of whom are losing their homes every day. I, it's a common occurrence, I'll be at the grocery store or at my kid's school and people are losing their homes because their rents are rising because their landlord is not renewing their lease for no, no stated reason, which is legal in Minnesota. Um, so I, I'm at the point where I need to go back to my constituents and be able to say that we are doing everything that we can within our power um, to keep people in their homes and communities that they love and that we are doing everything we can under our power to truly, you know, make good on our commitments to um, to set ourselves on track to be an equitable and inclusive city into the future, to make sure that um, rising housing costs and displacement aren't um, you know forever changing the face of our community. So for me to be able to do this in a transparent way, um, where we're able to discuss it here at committee and then able to discuss it as our budget process is really important. I'm not able to, to go through a kind of um, under <laughs> uh, what's a, a non-transparent process to um, see whether or not we might be able to bring something forward. So uh, that's important to me on this and I think will continue to be important as we go forward into the future. Thank you, Mr. Chair, for allowing this discussion. Thank you very much, Councilmember Goodman. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I appreciate the conversation with Councilmember Ellison in advance of today's hearing, which is how I knew about it, so I respect that. Um, I would say if we were doing everything in our power to not have rents go up, we wouldn't be raising property taxes 6.75%. So let's start with that. The biggest issue is that property taxes are going up as a result of unlimited spending. And so if we just were able to cut a few things here and there, we wouldn't have to raise taxes as much and that wouldn't affect rental rates as well as it affects everyone's everything, mortgage rates, all that kind of stuff. So we also have a lot of regulation that we've put into place on a whole number of levels, blower door tests and cutting holes in doors and all sorts of things. We're asking people to do that increase regulation in addition to property taxes going up. So I think there's a lot of things we can do short of rent control to control rising rents and no one seems to be suggesting that. I also note the ongoing direction of cutting out the city's housing policy staff. We have a housing policy research person, yet we're sending this to the coordinator's office. And that might be because you don't get the answer you want in one place, you just fish around for where you can get the answer you want. And that's why coordinators leave, because they feel like everyone dumps the work, the most controversial work on them, and they don't have the ability to say no. And I think we have pushed our staff to the point where it's almost at the level of disrespectful that we wouldn't have Katie Topinka as an example, who is our housing policy person in charge of this, but we would just send this to the coordinator's office at the same time that we don't have a coordinator permanently. So I think that's an issue. And then I would just ask the authors if this date is incorrect, because it says that there would be an update brought by November 13th, 2019, but the consulting contract shouldn't be 
should be in place no later than March 15th of 2020. So that I, maybe it, I don't know if that's incorrect. So, so I'm not sure I really understand that. I think the date's co correct and the idea is we'd find out if we were going out for an RFP for this contract or if the budget exists in the department. That's for a small update about how we're moving forward. And, I see, and okay. Correct Thank me you. if you're wrong, but that, uh, that's my understanding when I asked about the date. And then I guess I would ask how much the consulting contract would cost, how much money we're spending on this, and to be most transparent, we, it sounds like what you're suggesting and I appreciate is you're gonna bring it through the budget process. So yeah, that there so, would be a budget amendment to acknowledge how much this would cost and what the trade-off would be in order to do this study. Um, so those are my comments, thanks. Mr. Chair. Yes. Um, I can clarify that I, um, we certainly can bring it through the budget process if needed. It may or may not be needed, just like all the other work that's happening at the city. Yeah. But the November 13th date would be suitable so we can help figure that out at the committee here if we want to. Council Member Wright. Mm. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. I, I guess in a more mechanical version of what Council Member Gooden brought up, I, I do question why this would go to the coordinator's office even through this committee, this is not even the home committee for that department to make a staff direction. It would be the home committee of the coordinator, which is uh, I think the enterprise committee. And furthermore, um, I kind of agree that this should be the work of the department that's in charge of housing. I don't hate to be so literal, but uh, it just strikes me as that's the way we would go uh, if we were to go at all. Um, Council Member Bender. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I don't support changing the department or the staff direction as it is. I'm happy to continue to have that discussion. Um, we have repeatedly heard that there is a concern about staff capacity. Um, and so I think that's one issue that this was intended to address. The other piece is that this work that we just heard about is multidisciplinary. Um, so as we heard the, um, so we heard two pieces of work today, this anti-displacement work that was a collaborative um, you know, multi-city process with community partners and Policy Link, um, as well as the SREAP goal and strategy that was one of the three strategies that the council earlier this year adopted as our three priorities, right? And so um, that SREAP work is being coordinated through the coordinator's office. In that case, the renter, um, you know, the renter goal is being co-managed by CPED and regulatory services. So in terms of like a contractual, the work of scoping a contract, looking for budget, bringing us those recommendations, we went with the coordinator's office because it is truly more of a citywide question. So some of the data will come from regulatory services, some will come from CPED, some may come from other parts of the enterprise. So I hope that's helpful. It's more of a procedural and contractual question. Um, but also a staff capacity question. And frankly, um, I, again, I needed this, this, we need this conversation to be part of a public um, discussion. So in the past, it's taken a long time to get answers from things like, could we do this? Can, can we do this? Should we do this? Is it legal to do this? What would the budget be? And so I, just to be very clear, um, part of the intention of bringing forward a staff direction in this way is to, um, allow our constituents and the public to see this process transparently in the public view. Councilmember Ellison. Uh, I would just add that, um, you know, uh, I would echo the, 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 the concern about capacity. I know that staff is working on a lot of things, a lot of things that we've heard here um, in this presentation as well, preference policies and other anti-displacement uh, policy work. And because we're, you know, and it, this is a little bit before my time, but I know that uh, it's not uncommon for, uh, you know, um, uh, 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 contracts to go through the coordinator's office. It was, that's, it went that way through 415. That was a little bit before my time, but I know that was true. and. Um, um, and because we staff is also working on this is a research question and staff is working on hard policy and ordinances that they plan on bringing forward uh, uh, I you know I don't want to sort of uh, continue the, the 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 process of sort of just adding things to to the plate of staff and if there are concerns about housing staff's involvement I'm 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 happy to make sure the uh, uh, to follow up and make sure that staff doesn't feel like uh, uh, their work is being undermined or undercut uh, because because uh, I feel like that's that's certainly not the intention and um, and I'm happy to follow up on that as well uh, but again we have I think that we've all heard uh, um, uh, that concern about um, 
We've got a, a, a number of council members put, uh, pursuing large ordinances uh, that are going to be voted on and become policy. This is a research question about um, uh, uh, about the things that are outlined in the staff direction, not an ordinance being written for the council to pass. So I was just going to add that. Council member Brake. Uh, thank you, and I appreciate the conversation. And again, my comments have nothing to do about data collecting and research. I'm actually usually supportive of that in advance of policies and appreciate that the uh, horse is before the cart in that sense. Um, but I do uh, uh, would ask that the city coordinator is not really speaking to their capacity either. We're kind of speaking for departments and their various capacities um, in advance of an approval. We, we worked closely with the coordinator's office. And then also had discussions with the director of regulatory services, the city attorney, and and CPED. Good to hear that comment uh, from their perspective, Mr. Chair. So um, I'll just note and and um, that uh, staff is listening to this conversation too, and I do have some uh, sympathy for for your for your position. Um, it may be that when we come back in November, we hear a different idea about who's going to manage the contract and who isn't. So this is a, a first step, and I'm, I'm uh, comfortable um, supporting it as it is, um, saying the, the city coordinator's um, office will lead with assistance from. I would have been comfortable if there was a comma and it wasn't with assistance from and it was listed or whatever. So, I mean, I'm a little bit agnostic about all of that at this point, but I do think this discussion is really good because now we're going to figure out what's going to happen um, when it comes back and how are we going to be able to move forward with it and have the confidence with our staff and, our, and the council about where it goes from here. But. Um, why don't you give us your thoughts? Thank you, Mr. Chair, council members, committee members. I appreciate the, the time. Um, if I may, I would just suggest you strike with assistance from, right? The way we do this well as departments is when after you pass your staff direction, presuming that this passes, we get together and we talk about who is going to do which part as to the mechanics and as to who leads and as to who makes the report. And then we will have more information about that for you in November when we come back. Currently as written, directed to this committee. But what will happen should you pass this is we'll get together, CPED will, with the coordinator's office, with Reg Services, with the attorney's office, and talk about who's going to do what. So that's our job once you tell us that this is something that's a priority. I appreciate that, and it's kind of to, to my point. However we word it, the process will probably be the same, even if we leave the words in. But it'll be clear here. But I also want to um, defer to the authors of the motion. And, Thank you, Mr. Chair. This was actually responding directly to a situation that we had recently where there was those three departments plus the city attorney's office involved, and there was actually significant confusion about who was the lead staff person that Mr. Frank and I had a series of many discussions and emails back and forth, back and forth about work wasn't happening because it wasn't clear like who was the like the specific staff person who would need to be reporting back. So the reason that we stated in this um, staff direction uh, specific lead reporting back department was because of that experience of everyone seemingly not knowing that the council had hoped to have staff reporting back or staff producing work. Um, so I'm not sure why that would change in this situation compared to the past. So I think this was specifically in reaction to when we have a group of multiple departments all equally responsible for work and reporting back we seem to have had some timeline difficulties with or even knowing who was really ultimately responsible or coordinating it. So the attention here was to find staff in the enterprise who have capacity to do this work, who welcome doing this work and, and taking the lead on bringing us something back so that we may make our budget decisions in the timely way that we need to. Um, it wasn't intended to undermine anyone. It is intended to respond to concern about workloads, concern about confusion of roles and responsibilities, and to be as clear as possible so that when we're all coming back here in November, we're not kind of pointing at each other wondering why we aren't done. Thank you very much. Um, I don't see anybody else in queue to um, suggest a change, so we have this motion before us. I just want to speak to it a little bit because um, I really appreciate the thoughtfulness uh, of this and how it's very public and I think the um, aim is to get some information um, at some accurate information um, and very specific in some cases laid out here I'd also suggest that the way this is written um, 
it's clear that if property taxes are a part of the equation, we're asking them to do a financial analysis of return on investment and look at economic impacts um, to in the housing supply in short and long term. So we may get better answers to some of those questions as well. Um, so I'm, uh, in, and then we'll have another uh, another look at how this process is going forward on November 13th as well. So I appreciate that. Does anybody else want to weigh in before we take the vote? Seeing none, then all those in favor, please say aye. Aye. Any opposed, say no. No. Any abstentions? Uh, that motion carries. And seeing no further business before us, this meeting is adjourned. Thank you, everyone.